All right, I'm just going to start if you all need to take a break. Uh, we've got uh, this talk. I'll try to keep things brief, and then Jordan Wade will come up to wrap up the session. I'm going to give you a little bit of a smorgasbord of uh, different topics that um, might be on your mind in terms of um, managing other nutrients. And some of the work that we've done recently, some of that um, over, over the course. Um, so the outline today is really going to be talking. I'll get, <laughs> I was going to talk more about this, but I think at, at, you know, at this point, kind of the end of a two-day conference, not a lot of people. To, who, who, who is passionate about soil test extractants in the room? Can I see a show of hands? I got a couple people. All right. Excellent. Well, it just so happens that I am too, but for the sake of um, everybody's uh, <laughs> well-being, I will just gloss over this, but I, I'm happy to take questions. We're going to talk a little bit about micronutrients and uh, some of the work. It, it's, um, it's really a kind of a collection of work that, that uh, we were able to compile across the university. Grain removal rates and then tissue concentrations with fertilization. And these two pieces, the grain removal rate and the tissue concentrations are really stem from work that we did with these on-farm trials that have already been described, uh, looking at um, you know, these other pieces of nutrient management, right? So we're not talking about soil critical levels, but we're talking about nutrient removal rates and also uh, tissue concentrations as diagnostics. Conversion from Breda Malik. Uh, I showed this slide earlier. This is the same slide you'll see. Uh, we did a lot of looked at a, a couple thousand uh, soil samples, measured Bray and Malik. Um, there's a very good relationship there. Uh, essentially, Malik extracts about 35% more than Bray phosphorus. Suffice it to say that Bray P, uh, the tri-states as originally published, 1995, 15 to 30 part per million, is now 20 to 40 Malik P, okay? So ammonium acetate, the relationship, again, Malik extracts just a little bit more, but maybe about 14, 13% more. Is that the same number? Can we treat those the same? Uh, likely, yes, I, in my opinion. Okay. This is just the link, so you can remember in case you're interested in the work that I'm going to talk about now with micronutrients. Um, <clears throat> Go.osu.edu. It's a fact sheet that we published maybe uh, a year or two ago. And what we were interested in doing... Um, and I, I guess I'll, I'll preface this with saying that um, micronutrients like kind of remains this like elusive thing in terms of management. Um, we typically do not find a lot of responses. There's, we are not alone in the Corn Belt. There's been lots of studies, and some of them very recently. Iowa State, if, if you are interested in, in more about this, um, I would recommend that you just Google Iowa State soybean micronutrient. There's a really nice fact sheet that talks about the role of those micronutrients, and they've conducted literally hundreds of studies across several states and trying to find responses. And um, spoiler alert, there's uh, not a lack, there's a few instances of responses, okay? Um, but when we do find them, when we do see them, in many, in many ways, that can be predictable. So this is nothing new. It's, this is a table taken from the tri-states that were published you know, 25 years ago, but showing the micronutrients uh, of interest, um, the conditions where we might see a deficiency, and then the crops that are particularly sensitive in these conditions. Okay, So this is out there, um, and I'll move on, but you're welcome to you know, Google that, tri-state, and, and figure that out. What we did, uh, again, I, I mentioned in my earlier talk about Jay Johnson's soil fertility work and his reports over, uh, over um, I guess it was about 25 years. And then what's happened since then? So we basically went back and, uh, like, oh, I can't do that, uh, like data sluice, and we just tried to compile as much information. All the trials that Ohio State have done on micronutrient fertilization. So. Fertilize with micronutrient, measure crop response, okay? And, and we, we, by no means, are not the only people that do this. There's a lot of industry work that's done. But um, uh, what we had access to was the Ohio State data. We found uh, 194 trials total. Here's um, the nutrients, the crops, 
Interestingly enough, we cannot find a single trial in wheat that has been done. It's all in alfalfa, corn, and beans. Um, and sometimes those are single manipulations and sometimes they're blends. So if you add, I think if you add all these numbers up, it should equal 194. Somebody can fact check me later. <clears throat> um, at the end of the day, uh, th these numbers uh, in parentheses are the number of trials that were actually responsive. So we had quite a bit of work with manganese and soybeans. 109 trials, six were responsive. Micronutrient blends, um, 23 in soybean. Uh, all three of those that were responsive contain manganese, and so uh, that's a kind of a common theme that we have. Okay, we looked at all these trials, and there's a you know you think about compiling 194 trials and trying to share that data with you. It's like not really possible to do in a talk. We've got a, a obnoxiously long table that lists every single one of these one by one. If you're really interested, um, we took. And on a crop nutrient basis, we took all the trials, all the, the four trials in alfalfa and boron, and the nine trials in corn and boron, and we essentially averaged uh, <clears throat> those trials and calculated a percent increase or decrease from the control relative to the fertilized. And so if there's positive values here, it means across those nine trials, corn and boron, we got a 1.3% yield bump. In corn and in uh, sorry alfalfa and boron, we got a minus 0.5 percent yield decrease. Okay, so you can see the magnitude of response on average here is quite quite low. Like we're talking just a few percent increase or decrease. Okay, over, over all these trials, and this is not this is not uncommon. What other states have found as well. So uh, we went out and we conducted trials where we did. Uh, an entire micronutrient blend, and we analyzed crop. We did this a couple of different years at three different sites across the state, and we analyzed tissue at V5 for corn, R1 for corn, and then that grain for corn, as well as soybean at kind of uh, comparable time periods. And so this, in, in my opinion, is not definitive, but we did not see any yield response. And so we can take this collection of data and again, this is in that fact sheet that I, that I referenced, the go.osc.edu micronutrients, saying that, or suggesting that these levels are sufficient, that if you have this in your tissue levels, you're just not going to see, it's unlikely for you to see a yield response to fertilization. Okay? So that can be essentially a, a sufficiency level updated table with, with, with new hybrids and, and, and new information. So our conclusions that the only responses we observed were uh, 9 out of 40, uh, this should be 194 trials in soybeans, uh, in manganese. <clears throat> a conundrum that we have is that when we have an instance where we just can't find a lot of yield response, it's really difficult to develop diagnostic tools, right? It's difficult to know if malic 3 extractable zinc is a good indicator of uh, zinc availability, right? We just, we don't know. There's just like, we can't, we can't do that correlation calibration work because we don't have that many responses. And so the take home is that, you know, the tri-states are based on uh, an H, like different extractants, DPTA or uh, hydrogen chloride extraction for micronutrients. How many, how many labs actually run those extractants today? Not very many. Almost everybody is getting micronutrient information based on malic 3. How many people feel like a malic 3 micronutrient level is giving you good information that you can manage based on that? I don't know. I mean, maybe you're being polite, but uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, some people, I'm sure, do feel like that's a, that's a, a, a good number to base things on. I, I don't think that it's totally meaningless, but I'm just not sure it's going to really be a great diagnostic for, to tell you when you need to fertilize and when you don't. So what, in the absence of great diagnostics, what, what can we do? Well, we can do all the things we always do, right? We can look at plants and see where, we're, where things are chlorotic or, or looking weird. Um, <clears throat> we can certainly soil test and use plant analysis, plant analysis being probably the best indicator. Um, we can look at yield maps and we can assess environmental conditions to think about when we might actually see um, deficiency symptoms occur. 
And then finally, if you are making the decision to apply micronutrients, and there's a lot of micronutrient application that happens, I, I recognize that, um, but I'm just always going to encourage folks to leave a test strip. Just leave a strip where you're not applying and see what it looks like, right? See if, if you can find anything in a yield monitor, see anything visually of, of a, an effect by that fertilization. <clears throat> Questions on micronutrients? Maybe I'm full of baloney, but uh, this is all I got for you. Yes, sir. Hidden hunger. Mm -hmm. I have heard of hidden hunger. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, okay. I'm not familiar with the research behind that. Uh, who, can, who can enlighten us on hidden hunger? Nobody? Okay. Andrew, what you got? Okay, great. Yeah. <clears throat> sure. Good. Good comments about you know maybe uh, it's a uh, sometimes micronutrient deficiency is a product of uh, poor root development and how can we actually diagnose that or how is there a good index for that or something that we can do to measure. Measuring roots is very, very important, very difficult to do and it makes soil testing look like a, a walk in the park, right? Com root work compared to, compared to actually analyzing soil. And I, I guess I, I, so I don't have a great, I don't know if anyone has a response that I, I certainly don't in terms of how we might do that. I will say that I do, you know, I have seen micronutrient deficiency. It happens in the field. Does it happen when you all see it? Does it happen across the entire field? Typically not, right? Uh, when I've seen it, it's been patchy, and it might be on a sandy knoll, or it might be on a depression or something like that. But this is, again, one of these reasons why if doing f a field-based strip trial, it might be very difficult to see that as a, as a, a, a broad-spectrum response, right? It might just be patchy. So any other comments about micronutrients before we move on? Okay. Um, I want to talk about grain nutrient removal rates. This is maybe a little bit less of a contentious topic. Um, we have, a, across these fertilizer trials, um, analyzed, spent a lot of money and a lot of time analyzing grain samples in labs. So literally, at the inspection port, uh, you know, grabbing a grab bag sample of grain, sending that to the lab, and getting a total nutrient concentration. Okay, a couple thousand soil uh, corn samples, uh, 1,200 soybean samples, and about a little over 600 wheat samples. Again, our you can see our yields here, very respectable yields with quite a bit of range across these five years of trials that we conducted. Uh, we measured nutrient concentration by yield, okay? This is what uh, this is showing. Um, nutrient concentration is on that uh, vertical axis, and then this is just for corn. We did this for each crop. Um, and you can see those blue lines are essentially best fit lines, right? So <clears throat> when we think about crops yielding, um, I mean, I don't know what you, how you would think about it, but you, know, you, might, you might suspect that as your yields increase, maybe nutrient concentrations go down a little bit. And um, as the plant becomes more efficient, et cetera. But we really don't see, we see a little bit of this. We see a little bit of, of these lines slanting down as yields increase. Our concentrations essentially slanting down. But you can see how much, how much variability that are in the data, right? Like, <clears throat> again, each one of these little dots here is a sample from a part of a of a strip trial and it's got its own like little story behind it right we're not going to get into all that we certainly can't 
we can take the same information. So this is concentration by yield. And we can take and multiply the concentration by this yield to get an estimate of what, how much we actually are moving on a per bushel basis. How much, uh, pound, how many pounds of, not, of N, of P2O5, of K2O are we removing on a per bushel basis, okay? And that's what these uh, graphs show. Again, I've got N, P, and K for corn, soybean, and wheat. And you can see that um, for some things, like for nitrogen and soybean, it's actually, um, nitrogen rate is very well predicted by, sorry, the amount of, the amount of nitrogen that you pull off on a per bushel basis is uh, very uh, predictable based on the yield. So in other words, this axis is pounds of nitrogen in soybean per acre, and this is a function of, of the soybean yield over here. So there's variability. We're not surprised by that. So um, some of it, for say for corn, a lot more than we'd find for soybeans, for example. Okay, so so we take these values, then, folks, and then we're taking all, like this kind of messy data, right? And and we're we've constructed this table, and it's essentially supposed to be a guide to help you. There's a lot here, right? But it helps us understand what's going on. Grain nutrient removal rate. So this is corn, soybean, and wheat. Pound of nutrient per bushel of grain. In other words, on average, and again, there's a lot of variability here, but on average, when we're pulling off a bushel of corn, we've got 0.75 pounds of N in that. We've got 0.35 pounds of P2O5 per bushel of corn and 0.2 pounds of uh, K2O per bushel, okay? <clears throat> this is on a one bushel basis. We can multiply something and maybe an average yield 180 bushel for corn, 60 bushel for soybean, and 80 bushel for wheat. So here we take 170, uh, 0.74 pounds, multiply it by 180 bushel, and we get 134. Okay, so this gives you some estimate of how much, uh, it's not a perfect precise number, but it's a reasonable range with very relevant data with you know hybrids that span all we didn't control for hybrids folks planted what they plan across all these trials um, but it gives us good information very robust information about how much uh, what our nutrient removal rates are and again if we step back and think about the tri-states as they say when you're in that maintenance range when you're above the critical level you're going to be applying nutrients at your at removal rate so for example if you're in maintenance range and you're yielding 60 bushel soybean, the recommendation is going to be applying 47 pounds of P2O5 equivalent, okay? And then we can look, I mean, I, I like this table because this is really, you look at our micros, right? And you look at over the whole uh, grain, uh, a good, uh, well, a decent yielding corn crop, depending on where you're at, how much, you know, what's the poundage of micronutrient that we're actually removing there? It's, you know, this is, exactly why they're called micronutrients, not because they're not important, but because they occur in very, very, very small concentrations in plants, okay? Um, we can think about this from what the original tri-state did, and we don't have good information from this um, aside from K2O and P2O5, but here's our crops, corn, soybean, wheat, phosphorus, potassium, Again, the original Tri-States published in 95 said uh, P2O5, 0.37 pounds per bushel, and now it's 0.35 pounds. That's a 5% decrease, okay? But what we really want to look at here, uh, which is actually quite, quite surprising, we suspect that other states have found that there are generally a, this dilution of grain nutrients that's happened. Um, but if you look at what the original tri-state said, 0 .3, 0 0.27 pounds of K2O per bushel of corn, now it's a 0 0.2, so that's a 26, 25, 26% reduction in K2O concentration in grain. So, again, and this is going to feed back into our fertilizer racks, right? Um, and, and, and maybe it might not be precise in terms of maintaining... Uh, maintaining what our soil test levels are or what we want them to be, but in terms of if we're of that philosophy of applying nutrients at removal, then we can update our numbers based on this, okay? So is this a function 
Does this, you know, we shouldn't be, uh, we should be careful not to confuse this with crop need or crop uptake, right? This is just what is getting removed in the grain. Um, plants are bigger than they were 20 years ago. Uh, they're more productive. They've got larger root systems. They're taking up more nutrients. Um, it's just on a per bushel basis, there is a decrease in concentration. So if you were growing corn, 150 bushel corn 20 years ago, and 200 bushel corn today, are you actually removing less nutrients? Well, likely not. You're likely pulling more nutrients off. Again, on a per bushel basis, that's, that's where the decrease is happening. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Questions on this? Right, yeah. Okay, that's a great comment. I don't know if everybody heard, but basically a uh, commercial soil test lab perspective saying that he can see year-to-year -year variation in grain coming in the lab that they analyze. And again, looking at these concentrations, you know, say phosphorus in corn goes from, say, 0 0.2, 0 0.35, 0 0.37. So there's, you know, almost a doubling of a lot of data points. So there's a lot of variability that we see. We're never trying to pinpoint this and get it precise, but just as, a, as an average. And some people might say, okay, well, I'm going to take, excuse me, I'm going to take your, you know, your average here, and I'm going to, uh, there's been, other states have looked at and just said not the 50th, or not the average, but maybe the 75th percentile just to be conservative. So we can do that too if, if we really want to. Yes? <clears throat> any, the question is any P2O5, K2O, or N loss just by plant metabolism? Is that, is that right? Yeah. So, um, it's, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, we know that, um, I mean, we typically think of P and K as something that we don't, isn't really subject to a lot of loss. Obviously, we, you know, phosphorus and potassium do leave fields. Nitrogen is our leaky nutrient, right? Nitrogen has a gaseous loss. We, there's a lot of nitrogen, actually, that's, that as that corn or soybean plants in S down, there's a lot of ammonia that will get volatilized off those leaves, and it's just a net loss. So there's a much greater degree of inefficiency when it comes to nitrogen than for P and K. Does that answer kind of? Kind of, yeah. Okay. Okay, wrapping up, folks. Um, how does fertilization influence plant nutrient concentrations? This is work that a master student of mine, Puzon, has looked at and has uh, just finished her thesis on. <clears throat> I want to show, this is not the prettiest data, but <clears throat> these strip trials, <clears throat> we looked at leaf, typically R1, and actually this is, um, this is a percentage. I did not fix that. This is a, these are actually percent bases. Leaf and grain concentration. We looked at the control versus the fertilized. The question is, when we fertilize, do we see a bump in nutrient concentration? Very intuitive, right? We think that we're going to fertilize with P. It's going to, it's going to show up in the ear leaf of P or the trifoliate of, of P concentration, then trifoliate, and then as well as in the grain. <clears throat> Again, a lot of trials here. This is a gross average across everything. And you can see from the unfertilized or the control to the fertilized, very small differences. Some bumps. Uh, from you know 0.18 to point, uh, sorry 1.8 to 1.86, but again, just a few small percentage, maybe five percent, maybe six seven percent bump that we actually see. So, what does this mean? Well, um, uh, it means that a lot of you know some of this is going to be driven not by the fertilization practices, but maybe by the variety or the site or the, the site, the crop year, you know, the year that we actually had. Is it a good year? Is it a bad year? Et cetera, et cetera. I just wanted to show that as kind of a teaser. We still have some work to do to kind of understand some of this. And then lastly, I'm looking at the uh, early reproductive concentrations of corn, soybean, and wheat for phosphorus, and for potassium. So this is like, we can think of this as R1, like ear leaf concentrations or upper trifoliate concentrations, flag leaf concentrations for those respective crops. And these little box and whisker plots are just distributions of um, where all of our, you know, several thousand data points fell. Um, in particular, right here for corn, we can see that uh, if we look at these, these box plots, there's a little line in here. That's the 50th percentile. Essentially, half the observations fall above or below that. 
For corn, uh, Tri-State says 1.9% uh, or uh, you know, 19 grams per kilogram. And we almost half of our observations that came back in corn yearly for potassium were below that. So uh, the vast majority of these observations should fall in what the tri these dashed lines, which are what the tri-state calls sufficiency level. Just showing you this to, to underscore that we, we probably need to do a little bit of work with revising these sufficiency levels because they just need to get updated for modern hybrids. Okay. Questions on this? <clears throat> All right. So uh, just to conclude, micronutrient responses do occur but are, very, are rare, and they're rare across whole fields. So they're not rare in patches, but across whole fields, it's a different story. Grain nutrient removal rates per bushel have decreased over 20 years. Um, fertilization increases grain and leaf tissue concentrations just a smidgen, just a few percent but not a drastic change like you might, might suspect. And then just that last point of our sufficiency levels for tissue probably need to be revised, but we're, we're going to be working on that next year.